so delighted that Dr. Adil Malik, uh, Sasha Palakow Saransky, and Dr. Ananya Vajpayee are um, here to discuss with us. So, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I hope you've had a good dose of coffee and uh, some of that uh, sugar from those tremendous uh, brownies uh, to spark the next round. Um, I, I'm very pleased to be uh, sharing the stage this afternoon with some very um, thoughtful uh, leaders in the spaces that we will discuss, uh, writers, thinkers, uh, thought leaders, and we will have a chance to talk about the narratives that build and break walls. Now, when we talk about walls, we can imagine the most tangible expressions of walls, the Great Wall, Hadrian's Wall, Donald Trump's wall to be. Um, and uh, those are physical manifestations uh, that are either created by, to some extent, or reinforced by cultural narratives, by stories that we tell ourselves about why those walls should exist um, and we want, why we want to have walls. But today, we really want to explore not, the not just the physical manifestations uh, of those barriers and borders, uh, but the cultural, uh, personal, uh, ethical uh, uh, boundaries that we set in our cultures and between ourselves. Um, and so I wanted to start off uh, with uh, Adil Malik, um, uh, who could maybe share with us uh, his own work uh, and how he's dealt with, addressed these issues of the notion of borders. Uh, what voices historical moments? What kinds of uh, areas have you highlighted in your work uh, that deal with the notion of borders, um, barriers, walls, uh, in cultures, between cultures? What motivates you to write about them? And share some of your uh, work in that space, if you could. Sure. Great, well, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to share uh, my ideas. Um, as it happened during the summer, uh, I was writing, preparing a short uh, book for the Oxford University Press. You might have read some of these series, the very short introductions. Uh, so I was asked to write a very short introduction to Islamic finance. And I thought that would be a quick job for me. Uh, but then I started thinking about a chapter in that book on the moral economy of Islam. And uh, to work on that chapter, I had to step out of economics, go back into history, think about larger discourses on religion. And I was struck by my own, uh, how my own understanding of religion evolved, because as a child growing up in a Muslim household, uh, you are told about the stories of the rise of Islam, uh, which you obviously digest, memorize, and move on. Uh, but here I was uh, teaching uh, political economy uh, for the last uh, 14 years in Oxford, and I reread some of that history, and I discovered that, of course, in our present times, religion uh, can be a divisive and dangerous force. All across the world, we see a lot of conflicts driven by religion. But religion can also be a hugely important force in breaking walls or ethical uh, systems. And it's important because religion shapes our cognitive systems. Right? how we think about the world, how we view about the world. So I want to start off by sharing what I learned in the history of Islam, especially the rise of Islam, that I didn't know before in that uh, 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 sense. So the way I wrote that chapter was really to think about Mecca. A lot of you know how the rise of Islam in Mecca was uh, it sort of coincided with the emergence of a trading republic. Many people who write about Islam uh, think about uh, the growth of religion in, in, in a sphere where trade and religion were so intermeshed that they were uh, uh, inseparable from each other. And at that time, Mecca was, you know, a lot of these tribes were hugely fragmented, so they were really facing those, those walls. Um, and they had different uh, deities, right, about 360. But at that time in Mecca, there was a notion of haram, and haram was this idea that the place where you meet in Mecca, all these tribes, um, is sacred. And your life and property will be sacred and, uh, in that space, and you'll be secure. And in that process, before the arrival of Islam, uh, the power of uh, these different merchant clans uh, was held by the, the tribe of Quraysh, from which Muhammad arose. 
And uh, before the arrival of Islam, there was the leader of Quraysh, uh, Qusay ibn Kilab, who introduced three institutional innovations for society. One was to feed the pilgrims, give them water and arms, you know, sadaqa, rifaya, um, and uh, sikaya. His grandson took this institutional innovation to another level by doing two things. He made the financing of trade participatory, which meant that poor merchants could pool into, into these trading enterprises. And second, he created the notion of what is called ilaf. And ilaf are these trade agreements. I mean, these are kind of modern versions of free trade agreements. Uh, previous uh, to ilaf was this idea of health, that if you want to trade in this region, where much of trade is based on raiding and robbery, you actually create tribal alliances so that my goods are passing through, nobody else, other tribes will honor uh, the safe passage of goods. But he introduced the idea of ilaf. And the idea of ilaf was to actually create negotiated market access. So he traveled to Syria, met with a lot of merchant clans there, and said, look, give us free passage to move these goods, and in return, we will take your goods to the different fairs where we frequent. And that created a very interesting dynamic, which basically took the trading equilibrium beyond the tribal realm to more negotiated market access and expanded the scope and scale of our, our trade and allowed the mobility of people. But at the same time, as trade grew in Makkah, uh, there was huge inequality because you could see the specialization of labor. There's a lot more slave labor developing. Some merchants had greater capital, so they could uh, lend money to other traders. Uh, so usually became rife, and it was breaking the bonds of brotherhood. Um, there was also a lot of fragmentation amongst tribes. And one of the things I want to pitch in, and perhaps we'll come back to it later in Q&A session, is that some of the early struggles in Makkah were competition over religious symbols. Who controls these religious symbols? And of course, that control was not just about political control. It's also economic control, because a lot of trade around Mecca was through the pilgrimage. And the story that I built in that context is that the arrival of Islam in that context, it appeared to me, and the first time I realized that actually more than anything, this was a move from a limited to an open access order, because prior to the, the growth of this trade, a lot of the old tribal institutions were managing uh, a welfare provision, give, feeding uh, the hungry and sadaqa and arms, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but with the arrival of Islam, they, con they adopted exactly the same principles. So these sadaqa, uh, rifada, sakaya, all these principles were institutionalized and ilaf were also institutionalized, these trade agreements. But they were taken out of the realm of tribal benevolence and put into the realm of open access. Anybody could access those and institutionalize them at a massive scale. That was very interesting for me because the prophet in the early period when he left Mecca and he, he faced religious persecution, he had to move to Medina. And one of the first things which very few people realize what he did in Medina was to actually set up a market he went to the center of the town and put his tent there and said, this would be your market. Let there be no sections in it, which means there shouldn't be different people controlling the market. And let there be no fee in it. And so he actually said, it's a, market is a charitable endowment. It's suq al sadaqa. It's a charitable endowment. And he created the principle of what we today, the economists talk about, the two overriding principles of markets, autonomy, and participation. They should have autonomy for political control, and there should be greater participation. This was fascinating, and I, it, it led me to think about aspects of my own research, of my own religion that I hadn't thought before. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, then I started reading about religion and trade in more uh, generality, and thought about its contemporary relevance, which we can come back later. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Molly. Ananya, uh, you're a citizen of the world. But we discussed last night, you, your home is India. Um, you've written and studied in uh, the caste, caste system uh, in India and looked at social boundaries from that context and others. Uh, could you comment your work um, and the use of um, 
or the references to boundaries, walls, limitations, uh, social ones in the work that you've engaged in and how, how the, the metaphor of walls and barriers uh, has, has appeared in your research and work? Um, you know, I um, initially wrote uh, a book about the founding of the Indian Republic. And much of that obviously had to do with the creation of the Indian nation state after decolonization and um, you know, independence from, from British Empire. Um, and whilst writing that book, I discovered that many of the leaders, the thought leaders, as well as the political leaders of the Indian struggle for independence, um, actually were opposed to the idea of uh, nationalism and to the nation state in its modern form as a, a sort of you know, a monopolistic, uh, violence-based, territorial entity that, uh, uh, that then asserts its sovereignty uh, primarily through the exclusion of, of non-citizens. Um, so sort of founding fathers of India like, uh, like Gandhi and like Tagore were, were in some sense not nationalists. Mm -hmm. They ended up uh, you know, creating this, uh, this nation state, which was also the world's largest democracy. Um, but there were others involved in this uh, process of creating the republic, writing the constitution, um, and setting up the kind of scaffolding of this new democracy, um, like Nehru and Ambedkar. Um, and I am now working on Ambedkar, uh, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar. He um, was an untouchable. Uh, that is to say, he belonged to the sort of lowest of the low in terms of a social hierarchy of the caste system, which is what structures uh, Indian society, Hindu society especially. Um, and he came from this very deprived, marginal, and stigmatized social background, um, but rose to be uh, a great scholar, a great jurist, um, a, a political leader, uh, and ultimately the main uh, sort of author uh, he oversaw the drafting of the Indian Constitution. Um, and he studied at Columbia University and, and subsequently at the London School of Economics. And he had multiple degrees uh, in law, in political economy, and so on. Um, and I am now working on uh, a sort of intellectual biography uh, of Ambedkar. Um, and you know, I'm interested in him for two reasons. I mean, primarily, among, amongst many others. One was his involvement in giving um, India, uh, through the Constitution, through the writing of the Constitution, uh, these new avenues uh, for uh, democratic participation, for equal citizenship, for you know, liberty, equality, fraternity, justice, uh, all of these kind of, um, you know, modern resources uh, that he learned about from um, the British, the French, the American uh, revolutions and the, the, the making of these democracies. Um, but internally, within Indian society, and this is something that he, he spoke about at the, at the very moment of the promulgation of the Indian Constitution, that you know, it's all very well to have political independence. Uh, but until we have social justice, uh, we are not really free. We are not providing uh, a true equality uh, and, and a true freedom to, to, to Indian citizens. Um, and the question of social justice, of course, went to the heart of the caste system, which is a system of graded inequality, um, which keeps people um, divided from one another, uh, doesn't allow for social mobility, uh, doesn't uh, permit uh, for uh, a genuine sort of mentality uh, of equal access, equal participation, and uh, equal rights um, within a notionally democratic and egalitarian uh, framework. Um, so one of the first things that, uh, that Ambedkar helped to right into the Constitution was to uh, render untouchability, which was the most extreme form of this practice of inequality uh, within the, the caste framework, uh, illegal and unconstitutional. 
uh, and it was, it was outlawed from the get-go. But this doesn't mean that even 70 or 75 years after independence, India has actually achieved um, a, a genuine kind of uh, social equality um, and, and forms of social justice uh, that allow uh, for different social groups to, to participate equally uh, in, in the political process uh, and in its, in, its, in its outcomes, in a sense. And now that, and I should, I should just add that, I mean, you know, I, I would have gone along happily writing about caste and, and the struggle for social justice in that sense alone. But now that uh, Indian politics has taken a turn towards explicit majoritarianism, um, you know, there's a sense in which different kinds of minorities are being rendered as second-class citizens, even within, again, this, uh, this, this appearance of being the world's largest democracy. So now it's religious nationalism, and it's Hindu majoritarianism. Um, so it's not just sort of within the Hindu community that there are disenfranchised caste groups, but between the Hindu majority and all other religious minorities, uh, there's a new kind of hierarchy, and there are new kinds of walls that are go going up uh, within, within um, the current uh, dispensation. Um, and so the question of, of borders and um, the struggle against um, this kind of uh, internal, uh, you know, this, this kind of, um, the, the creation of, 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 of new hierarchies uh, of, of unequal citizenship. Uh, within a context of majoritarianism is added to the already existing and long-running problem of, of caste. Um, so this is something which one is uh, sort of more urgently now mm. engaged with. I mean, it's no longer, for me at least, not just a, a kind of biographical enterprise that I'm engaged in, but I, I really think that, um, you know, the, the survival of the Indian constitutional framework is in danger at the mm. moment. Mm. Um, and so it's very important to go back to its, uh, you know, to the vision of those who created this this document, um, which had such a warrant for the, for true emancipation, for true social justice, and which is which is very much in danger today. Thank you. We'll come back to some of what you've touched on, um, Sasha. You've written about uh, migration movements, uh, cross national borders, uh, what it means. Um, um, if, if you could share with us some of your thoughts on how the issues of borders uh, feature in your work and, and how you see them and interpret them in terms of what it affects on society, affects on culture, um, your observations uh, on borders and boundaries. Sure, thanks. <clears throat> well, I think there are two ways of, of talking about these borders in the very physical and literal sense of huge numbers of, of refugees and migrants from around the world, mainly poorer countries in the world, trying to reach Europe, the United States, Australia. And then there are also conceptual boundaries, which Adil and Ananya have alluded to, and, and I want to talk about a little bit, dealing with citizenship and deservingness and who is a part of a community and entitled to be part of a community and who is not. And I think that a lot of the political debate that we see in this country now in the midst of an election campaign, but for that matter, most of Europe, and certainly in the United States now, it is focused on this question of citizenship, who belongs, and even if you're a citizen, do you really belong? And so I started looking at this in 2015 during the refugee crisis at a moment when over a million refugees, many of them, most of them from Syria, were, were coming to Europe, and right-wing parties throughout Europe, from France to Holland to Denmark, were taking advantage of this situation and, and, and really exploiting it in order to argue that their societies were now under threat from a group of people who, in many cases, were fleeing terrorism, but in the rhetoric of people like Marine Le Pen in France, or later Salvini in Italy, they were turned into a terrorist threat themselves, even though they were fleeing it. And so the, the issue of, of 
refugees, migration, asylum was transformed from an issue of helping people in need into one of protecting societies from a threat. Mm -hmm. And so in a physical sense, it's very clear how, how these borders manifest themselves. All of you probably recall seeing images of huge numbers of people, many of them children, trying to cross fences on the Hungarian or Serbian border, trying to cross from Greece into other countries and pass through Europe and, and reach a, a safer country. Recently in this country, we've, we've just seen a devastating tragedy, almost 40 people locked in a shipping container trying to reach the UK. And so there's a very uh, sort of concrete manifestation of this. People die in order to cross these borders. But there's also th this sort of rhetorical device that politicians are using throughout the world right now that, that frames this as, as our security. So we need to protect our borders against these people who are coming from elsewhere. And one of the ways that this is done is to outsource it, right? So instead of doing the dirty work oneself, um, they will, governments in Europe will pay governments in North Africa, for instance, to detain refugees and migrants trying to reach Europe, often in very dangerous and demeaning conditions in places like Libya. Um, in Australia, they will send them to offshore islands where they're out of sight and out of mind, and no one has to encounter uh, the horrors that these refugees and migrants are experiencing because they're off in an island in the middle of the Pacific. And so uh, one of the things that I've found in researching this is that there's also uh, a divide, a wall, if you, if you will, between academia and journalists who are, who are trying to write about this. And one of the things I've observed is that there are huge numbers uh, of academic authorities, real experts in all sorts of fields from anthropology to economics to history, who are very concerned about this issue, as we all should be, but are not really reaching a larger audience. So instead of a professor at Oxford who's an expert on the history of migration from Africa to Europe uh, dominating the national debate, we have people like Nigel Farage dominating the national debate on this issue with sound bites or Daily Mail headlines. And so I think that th th there's also been a real difficulty um, for, for experts who care about this issue to break through in, into um, the mainstream media and to reach a larger audience, which I actually think is vital at a moment like this, because if they don't, and the, the narrative is left to politicians who have a stake in keeping people out and whose entire political careers depend on a rhetoric that focuses on keeping people out, um, what you end up seeing is, is what Ananya was alluding to in, in India, is, is the creation of second-class citizenship. And this is happening everywhere. We saw it very clearly in this country with the Windrush scandal, where people who have lived in the UK legally for their entire lives were either deported or had their citizenship questioned, and some of them died in the process of trying to prove that they were as deserving a citizen as everyone else in this country. Um, we've seen it to some extent in the US in terms of Trump's rhetoric towards judges of Latino descent um, to American citizens who are not of white European descent. And so what happens when the voices of academics and others who, who care deeply about this issue and know much more about this issue are crowded out of mainstream debate is the field is left open to the Trumps and the Farages and the Le Pens of the world, which is very dangerous and I think is only going to entrench this kind of majoritarianism where uh, whichever group is demographically dominant in a given place will start to redefine citizenship as equivalent to being part of that majority. And that becomes very dangerous because instead of having a civic democracy, you then have an ethnic democracy and that leads down a very dangerous road.
I'll stop there. Thank you. That's very helpful. I want to build on what you're saying and ask each one of you to elaborate more on the, the theme of narratives as part of your work and in terms of uh, explaining uh, these boundaries, whether they're social boundaries, economic uh, history and boundaries, uh, uh, religion as a unifying theme. Um, and, and you've touched on this in the context of immigration, Nigel Farrar, uh, Donald Trump. Um, could you elaborate on, on the power and use of narrative in building and breaking barriers and walls? And as part of that, could you go a bit further and say, are there, is it a binary choice? Is it about uh, tearing down walls or building walls? Um, is there an in-between? Are, are there places where identity and preservation of identity and position, uh, spatial location uh, is appropriate? Uh, but maybe we want porous boundaries, interactive, uh, such as trade. Uh, Malik? Well, I mean, I'm an economist, so obviously trade is quite central for me. Uh, but one of the more central questions of political economy is how do you elicit cooperation amongst groups? We know human beings are a cooperative species, but cooperation and conflict has been a key issue. And of course, every social order, every society tries to solve that problem of violence. Now, sometimes you do that through exclusion, right? Mm -hmm. By creating barriers and creating, you know, solidarities. Um, but of course, there are certain areas where economics has had a huge influence. So for example, much of the Enlightenment era economics is all about trade, trade as a civilizational force, trade as a cooperative device. I mean, Fernand Braudel talked about uh, trade as a cooperative device. And when they were thinking about trade, they were thinking about not disembodied exchange, embodied exchange, and I'll come to that in a minute. By embodied exchange, I mean to say it's not just importing goods from China or from other places, but to actually, uh, in a distant manner, but to actually engage in trade in ways that cultivate social relationships, that creates mutual interdependencies, that creates reciprocal obligations. You know, we, we work together uh, on things, and that has uh, uh, migration linked into it. And that's where I think narratives can play a hugely important role. So for my particular vantage point, thinking about you know, religion and trade, it was fascinating that in that time in Mecca, where tribal institutions were only providing welfare to people within the tribe, social order was breaking down. And so one of the first things that the prophet asked for was to make it more universal. Right. And in doing that, what you see is that with the rise of Islam, you had uh, uh, an idea that has been there long enough, which is of monotheism, which is there's one God, no other God, which could be as Amon Roy in India's context when he wrote about the history of Islam, he said it could be a, a revolutionary idea because in a sense it means, you know, uh, uh, there's one higher supreme authority, and that supreme authority, whether it's Christianity, Judaism, or any of the great religions, is allied with the poorest and the weakest of the segments. So in a sense, it means you defy all hierarchy and create an equalizing space. And what's interesting uh, for me in my research is that Islam acted as a key agent of trade, and trade acted as a key agent of Islamization. Right? So if you look around the world today, if it's East Asia, uh, the spread of Islam in East Asia, whether it's the Straits of Malacca or other, you had the role of the Hadrami merchants from Yemen traveling all the way. And there was not disembodied exchange. These were people who were going there, settling down, marrying, creating institutions. If you go to the heart of Singapore, you'll find the wakufs, the kind of charitable endowments set up by many of these traders. If you think about India, this cross-border movement from Central Asia and the Middle East of Sufis, all the mystical figures who were key to the spread of Islam in South Asia, traveled along trade routes. All of them traveled along trade routes and settled down. And in that context, they were always very inclusive. Right? Similarly, one of the movements that really fascinates me is the Sanusis of, of uh, Sahara region. Again, these were Sanusis were a Sufi brotherhood that would typically travel uh, and create uh, Sufi hospices, you know, these, these hospices on the borders of different tribes. So there's one tribe separated from another tribe, and they will locate themselves on the border of those tribal communities and at the intersection of the long distance Hajj routes. 
the trade routes that connected. That kind of larger economic connectivity was very much connected with the social idea and with the idea that you could deal with difference. And I think what I'm saying is not to say, well, here Islam was high in offering a very higher order moral order and all the rest is, 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 is inferior. What I'm saying is that your conception of religion, your understanding of religion can shape, uh, 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 shape what kinds of barriers you will build. And that there is potential. Uh, there's recently a book, a uh, very inter interesting book by Princeton University Press. I forgot the author is called Big Gods. And it talks about how monotheism, in a sense, created long distance uh, trading relationships. Uh, in each of these cases, you would find that civilization has never prospered anywhere in the world. In fact, no civilization has been created without dealing with difference. If you cannot deal with difference, you cannot create civilization. Yet today, we have in the West, all the vanguards of civilization talking in terms of difference. And I think we need to go back to history and those ideas to deal with difference. And here, I'm not really speaking to people in the West, but people in the Muslim world. Because we don't understand the role that religion can play in creating, in kind of breaking those walls. And of course, if, uh, if you read today what's happening in Iraq, um, the sectarian order, who's contributing to it? There are many religious figures. The Ayatollah Sistanis are also involved in it. You know, the Saudis are also involved in it. And what's interesting is that religion and trade were fundamentally interconnected in the Quran. But it was the creation of Saudi Arabia. It was the need for political order to control trade that religion, these trading routes were controlled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a fundamental uh, uh, a connection between religion and trade was, uh, was, was, was abolished. But I want to end on, on some of the three things that we face today. You know, think about the problems of the world today in the economic sphere. There are kind of three key issues that are coming up. There are trade wars. And it's all about you know, trade balances, current account balances. Uh, there is inequality. Inequality in the US and in UK as well is very high proportion. So how much should the rich contribute to society is an issue. And then there is migration that, that Sasha meant, mentioned. In all of these three aspects, we are dealing with a view of the world that creates zero-sum interaction. Mm -hmm. And all great religions, whether it's uh, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, all the great traditions have actually talked about going beyond a zero-sum framework. Mm -hmm. And I think the, you cannot create a new political economy without really thinking about a new moral economy. Thank you. Ananya narrative in your work uh, with the yeah. growing Hindu nationalism uh, and its tensions with the original constitution and the people who informed that. Right. The power oh, of narrative. You know, I think, I mean, you, can, you cannot tell the story of modern India without, uh, without thinking about the central role of narratives, uh, historical narratives and literary narratives, and epic narratives and so on. Uh, and this is explicit. This is not, you know, you don't need to be uh, a trained philologist mm -hmm. reading texts uh, in order to see this. It's writ large in our, in our political life. Um, so, you know, earlier I was interested in, for example, the classical sources of modern Indian political thought. You know, why was Nehru interested in the figure of Ashoka, who was this ancient uh, Indian mm -hmm. emperor? Um, why was, why was Gandhi, you know, why did he read the Bhagavad Gita every day, uh, which is a text about war, when he was uh, propounding his theories of nonviolence? You know, why did Ambedkar turn to the life of the Buddha and become a Buddhist uh, at the end of his life in his quest for social justice? Um, why was Tagore reading ancient uh, Sanskrit poetry, classical Sanskrit poetry by Kalidasa? which completely rejects modern notions of, of, of time and uh, space and ter territoriality and so on. Um, so what, what kinds of narratives were being mobilized in the imagination of this new polity, which they were calling India, at the time of independence? Today, there is, in this attempt to revise the idea of India, and move it away from being 
a secular, plural, inclusive, diverse uh, democracy, which is not founded on the principle of any kind of an ethno-nationalist um, uh, you know, core, uh, where citizenship is not based on um, your religion or your language or your ethnicity in any way. The attempt to, to revise that and recreate India as a Hindu nation, um, as a Hindu Rashtra, which I really call a Hindu Reich, you know, um, all of it hinges on mobilizing a different set of narratives, right? The narrative of partition. Mm -hmm. Why did Pakistan okay. get created as a Muslim homeland, but we never had a Hindu homeland um, symmetrically at the time of independence? Why, why are there so many Muslims in India? Because we were always being invaded mm. by Muslim mm. hordes who mm. were coming in from, mm. you know, Arabia and Turkey and Mongolia and Central Asia for a thousand years, right? A narrative of invasion mm -hmm. um, and incursion of others mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. what is ours, mm -hmm. uh, into our homeland. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, um, the narrative of the epic, you know, in, in, you know, in Sanskrit there are two epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. Uh, like the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, and the Ramayana, which is the older of the two epics, uh, is, the is the story of, of, of Ram, um, who is a kind of warrior god, um, who must go and rescue his wife from the demon king Ravan and return to uh, his kingdom after a long period of exile and then a, and then a war. Um, and it is around this figure of Ram that um, Hindu nationalists are trying to reimagine a kind of Hindu polity as the perfect kingdom of Ram as it is articulated in the epic. Now, what is so interesting is that the epic is about Ram's moral dilemmas more than about his, um, his wars and battles and conquests. Uh, he's actually n not very politically astute at all. He gets done out of his kingdom in the first place. Then somebody abducts his wife and runs off with her. He has great difficulty in bringing her back. The minute he brings her back and they're set up as king and queen, uh, she leaves him uh, because uh, doubts are cast as to her, her, her purity after she spent all this time with Ram's rival. Um, and their marriage falls apart. Uh, and uh, at the end of the epic, he commits suicide, right? Now, instead of reading the kind of uh, human um, uh, dilemmas and the moral conundrums that the character of Ram faces in the epic, what is being highlighted is this idea of um, um, uh, a nation built by warriors, uh, by epic heroes, mm -hmm. the demonization of others, mm -hmm. right? That the, 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 the demon rival of Ram is now the Muslim other. Right. But of course, the, the Muslim is now one of us. Right. You know, there's, there's no othering possible. Right. It, it is a minority within, within the many minorities of the world's most diverse country. And so um, you end up creating really these new forms of um, uh, biopolitical, these yeah. biopolitical yeah. structures like for example, this, this government is trying to create a national registry of citizens, the NRC. Um, and the whole purpose of, of creating this, also a, 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 unif a universal identification system, a new kind of identity card that they're trying to create. The whole purpose of this enumeration and census exercise of the, of the, of the entire population is to exclude many people from citizenship and say they are not citizens, they are illegal immigrants, much like it's, it's happening in the United States, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, they, uh, you know, it's not clear how they got here. Yeah. Uh, if yeah. they're Muslims, chances are that they have just filtered in from Bangladesh or from Burma yeah. or from yeah. Afghanistan yeah. or from yeah. Pakistan, and they shouldn't have been allowed to live here all along. Yeah. So under the guise of counting citizens, you're actually excluding yes. many from yes. citizenship, yes. right? And the purity of the Hindu nation is thereby being established simultaneously. Yeah. Um, 
So on the one hand, you have you know, literary texts like the Ramayana uh, and the figure of this, this god hero, Ram, absolutely at the center of, of your political vision. But on the other hand, you have these new bureaucratic technologies to, to, to create exceptions and to exclude, um, or in places like Kashmir, to create you know, mm-hmm. a, a suspension of the rule of law um, uh, where you have a Muslim population already uh, yeah. sort of spatially uh, concentrated, right? Um, so I think um, it's largely by trying to shift from a secular narrative to mm-hmm. an ethno-nationalist narrative yeah. and mobilizing the requisite uh, uh, you know, governmental technologies as well as texts, really literary texts, historical texts, and so on, um, that uh, you know, we are going to probably end up with a very different India, yeah. uh, even in the near future, than we've had uh, for most of the 20th century. You've given us a compelling example of how uh, this belonging and othering concept of being within a society and excluding others mm-hmm. has its roots in hundreds, if not thousands, of years of culture, traditions, and stories. Mm-hmm. I wanted to jump to the pe- present. What can we do about that? What's the role of storytelling narratives in, in the present? to move those traditional narratives to a different place, if that's what we so desire. And Sasha, just a couple of minutes before we turn it over to the audience, uh, in the context of the migration issues that we're dealing with globally now, um, you talked about a narrative of empathy, of welcoming. Uh, uh, the US Statue of Liberty has a poem that says, give us your tired, your poor, yearning to be free. A narrative of welcome, a narrative of inclusion, a narrative of celebrating diversity. Uh, we talked earlier today about the, the emotion of joy uh, in, in narrative, um, and yet we are dwelling now in a space of fear, um, where the narratives that dominate are ones of fear. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on the narratives in today's um, um, clash of, of the clash of narratives um, in boundary setting, identity, in the context of migration, before we shift to the audience? Sure. I I think one important thing to realize is that when people talk about borders, they're often not talking about physical borders of a country. And it it really comes down to a question about rights. So people who say secure our borders are not really interested in a wall, even if they cheer on Trump's wall and, and they happily respond to politicians who say that they'll keep people out and turn boats back around at sea. It's really about protecting what people in Britain or Australia or the United States regard as ours and protect, to protect what's ours from them. And I think that it's worth looking for a minute at, at how politics on left and right have shifted and collapsed and blurred to some extent in the last few years. Because if you look at the old right in much of Europe and in the United States, they tended to be mostly focused on free trade, free markets, not terribly concerned about free movement of people in many cases. And sometimes that was for not so noble reasons. You have lots of of libertarian right-wing politicians in the United States in the 80s and 90s who were perfectly happy for for migrant workers to come from Mexico and, and Latin America and be paid sub-minimum wages, uh, p- picking fruit in California. But the, the concern was about free trade and free markets. And if some people were crossing borders, uh, they turned a blind eye or were actually quite happy about it. And I think that, that what has shifted is that you now have parties on the right, especially throughout Europe, who have taken what used to be a left-wing idea, the defense of the welfare state, and turned it into their central political idea. And this has happened dramatically in the last 10 years. And you see it in places like Denmark, in Holland, in France. Um, They might not use the word welfare state all of the time, but what they're talking about is a defense of certain rights and privileges that we, the citizens of Denmark or Holland or France, have, and that we are going to protect as ours from anyone who comes in and tries to share in that wealth and those benefits. And so I think that the the rhetoric about borders, often if you look more deeply, is really about uh, protecting our larger slice of the cake and not letting people from other poorer parts of the world come in and, and, and to share in that. And so I think that, that what this comes down to in terms of shifting it, if you want me to try to end on, a, on an optimistic note, um, 
is, is, is it's really about redefining us and them mm. in modern democracies. Mm. And what Ananya mm. has been describing in India is the opposite trend, the narrowing mm. of the us, and in some mm. cases, the, the very methodical shearing off of certain populations who will no longer be part of us and become them and are stripped of their citizenship. Um, the same thing happened with Windrush here. Uh, and so th the question then is, is how, how does a society and how do political leaders in a society create uh, a more inclusive, broader sense of us? And I think that it's interesting to see how quickly it's turned in the US because if you think back to the Obama era, um, sure, there was still plenty of racism and discrimination in the US, but th the general rhetoric from the top and, and the general pervasive feeling in society, in my view at least, wa was far more inclusive. It was much more the give us your tired, your poor, the e pluribus unum, um, these sort of classical American ideas of inclusion, and that's turned very rapidly, I would argue, because of a message from the top and because of the tone of Trump and the people around him, and it's legitimized a narrowing of, of who we are as Americans. Um, and, and when that messaging comes very clearly from the top, then uh, many people throughout society take it as a, legit, a, a, as a cue that mm. they can spout anti-Semitic, anti anti-black, anti-Muslim rhetoric, and it's, it's permitted. And so I think that, that in large part, it, it's simply about leadership and cues mm. and, 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 and what is portrayed as legitimate discourse in a society. And the last thing, since you mentioned fear, that I think it is really worth taking seriously is that fear is a much more powerful political mobilizing force than anything else. So as much as we might not like it, and as much as we might prefer uh, Obama's hope and change rhetoric, um, the mobilizing force of yeah. fear yeah. is much more effective. Yeah. And Trump knows yeah. that, and yeah. he's used it yeah. very effectively to his advantage. And so I think that the first step is to create a counter message that shows people that, that the fears and, and the populations and the groups that they've been told to fear are actually not a threat, and that they're not taking anything away from them. And that's something that that economists in particular um, can help with because most of, of the serious academic research on migration shows that there isn't yeah. a, a, a massive decline in the livelihoods of, of so-called natives um, w when newcomers arrive. And so I think that it's not an easy thing, but starting to, to pick apart and, and counter those, those messages of fear and convince people that they are not threatened is the first step towards trying to, to, to create a new narrative around, around immigration. Thank you. This is the kind of conversation we could have for days, and I know all of you who have written in this space, um, and so I apologize for the limited time, but I thought it'd be time now to open it up to questions and comments from the audience. And we only have about 10 minutes, so if you could keep your uh, questions brief, it'd be helpful. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the wonderful uh, panel. Uh, my name is Ersalan and I'm a fourth year scholar. This might be a slightly tangential question. Uh, so earlier, Danny referred to uh, the importance of sort of using or telling narratives at scale. And um, if I were to read, uh, if I'm reading the Yuval Harare correctly, one of the, uh, one of the, like one of the good things that our species did over other sapiens was that we were very good at telling stories, uh, which which can scale. So for example, our religions, our economic system, our justice system. And if one were to I think find a common thread in these stories, is the if one were to find a common thread in these stories, it's the it's their ability to bond people together. Right? So essentially what is happening recently is uh, that stories which are devising people. So as Sasha mentioned, uh, divisive political rhetoric. Uh, now we are seeing that there is a there is a public consumption of these of these narratives as well. So what has changed uh, over the years? So what is your take on this? Could you hear the question? 
Did you get the question? There is a bit. There's a bit of echo. So I, I, I think the speakers are being yeah. uh, need to be turned so that because uh. it's going back that way and it's. Did you did you cap? Okay, we we have somebody. I can I can briefly repeat the question. If you Please. That narratives that um, unite versus narratives that yes. divide. Yes. Yes. And why have one sort why of narratives? Change? Yeah, changed over into the other. I think that that was broadly okay. that was broadly. Go. You want me to go? Please. Okay. Sorry if I missed the first part of the question yeah, because yeah. of the speaker echo. But um, so what? What has changed to allow these new new divisive narratives to, to become the centerpiece of political debate? Is that the? Yeah. Why? The just why as a species now we have more uh, consumption or more appetite for for these devices? Okay. Because historically yeah. we don't have. Uh, yeah. And it's precedent. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I, I, I think part of it is, is what I, I was describing before in, in that prominent leaders have, have given their populations a, a message from the top um, that, that they are being threatened and mobilized that fear. But I also think that th there's something to say for, for political realignment. And so I, I mentioned briefly how far-right parties in Europe are now using the defense of the welfare state and the benefits that, that they enjoy at, as a way to mobilize voters and to steal voters from, from what used to be left-wing parties. I would say also that there's been, in many countries, an abandonment of economic ideas as the central uh, tension between right and left in, in political debate. And so, um, this has allowed far-right parties who are virulently anti-immigration to fill a space in terms of economic policy debates that used to be occupied by left-wing parties. And so I think that it, as you see um, you know, the, the social democrats in, in, in Scandinavia, socialists in, in, in France, uh, democrats in the US sort of become more, become seen by larger elements of the population as more establishment parties, then populists, whether right or left, are able to, to, to seize that territory. And the, the populists on the right have done it much more effectively by, uh, by arguing that, that these are our resources and our benefits and that we need to protect them. And so, so to me, that, that's one of the most uh, convincing explanations for, for why the shift has happened politically in, in such a dramatic way is that that part, old parties of the left have, have abandoned a lot of the political turf, if you will, that, that they used to occupy. And as that becomes an open space, someone else can move in. And the people who've moved in, in in an opportunistic way happen to be on the far right and happen to be xenophobes. Sorry, can I just add, yes. add a little bit to? Um, You've got one minute. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, just picking up on this idea of fear, um, you know, uh, Arjun Alpadurai wrote a wonderful little book called The Fear of Small Numbers, uh, which explains um, the psychology of majoritarianism. You know, why, why, do we f why do we fear minorities, right, who are exactly not uh, a threat, who are precisely minoritized sections of the population? both numerically as well as, uh, you know, in, in, in economic terms, in, on every kind of social indicator. Mm -hmm. uh, in a place like India, minorities are, are really minoritized. So why fear them? Um, and why do, why do uh, bigger identities, the majorities, uh, turn predatory? As in, why do they want to consume that minority, digest it, and completely eliminate it? Um, and some of that explanation comes from the idea that um, if, if there's a very small gap between the whole and the majority, that gap is occupied by the minority. So if you can eliminate the minority, you would close the gap and you would become the totality. The entire nation would become your people, would become you, would become us, right? And the other would be completely eliminated. So it's only that really small gap um, that keeps you from total power, right? And this is the kind of fear that right-wing populists the world over and de democracies the world over that we are concerned with um, uh, are, are exactly playing up. And that's why you hear these divisive narratives um, where really 
you know, um, the white Christian male population is feeling threatened by uh, the African American, or the upper caste, middle class Hindu uh, majority is feeling threatened by minority Muslims or Christians or Sikhs. Um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make logical sense, it doesn't make rational sense, but uh, through the mobilization of this kind of fear, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it works. It, unfortunately, it works politically, and then it hijacks the political process, as we are seeing everywhere um, uh, in, in, in the world today. One last question. Um, yes, in the back. Hi, I, I just wanted to, um, thanks very much for the, for the panel. I just wanted to th uh, throw a bit of a spanner in the works. Um, I mean, the, the mobilizing effects of fear in the UK, um, and I noticed how little the UK was mentioned as an example, and I was interested in that on, on this panel. Um, in the UK, you know, the, the right currently kind of dismiss the um, pro-Remain argument um, as project fear, right? We are, you know, we, we're inciting fear of you know, poverty and so on, but that may be caused by a separation from Europe. So, so I was wondering whether, in addition to the fear of minorities and so on, which I completely agree is a, you know, a, a valid driver in, in some contexts, um, in addition to that, it's not also a romanticization of some very old and dangerous myths of being native, of belonging, of you know being centered in your own space, and people coming from elsewhere being, you know, invaders. They're, they're, those, I mean, we, we we have heard in disguised form some of those dangerous stories being being told here in Britain, subsequent to the the EU referendum, and before. Adil, you want to comment on that? Yes, I mean, I think I have uh, not really a specific response, but two aspects that kind of relate to your, your point and broader discussion. We haven't really talked about both of those two aspects. Of One is that whenever there is division, there's always somebody benefiting. Mm -hmm. That's why we always have, when we think about colonialism, the logic of colonial rule was divide and rule. When the French went to Algeria, they had to invent the Berber-Arab division because without that division, you cannot really rule. Uh, so the story and narrative was really the translation of Ibn Khaldun, the French translation of Ibn Khaldun. They took through that historical narrative the difference between Berber and French, uh, Berber and, and Arabs. And after the independence, the Algerian regime used exactly the same logic to divide people. And you know what, as now the Algerian protesters are coming out on the streets, there are messages circulating on social media. Please don't wear any uh, visual representation of Berber identity. Please don't wear any visual Islamic label. Please don't wear any attire for the football club because we know that the regime would use this to divide us. And the same thing, you know, if you think about the UK, one of the issues is growing inequality. The failure of the highly globalized London elite to sort out mm -hmm. deep-seated problems of mm -hmm. inequality mm -hmm. within society. Mm -hmm. So I think this aspect of power is extremely important. Mm -hmm. The other aspect, which we haven't talked about, is that in some sense we do need to retain borders. Yeah. One way in which we tried to remove borders was through globalization. Because when we remove borders, we try and create large-scale patterns of conformity, mm -hmm. right? Whereas if you look at all the mm -hmm. Uh, the great works, I mean, one of, I'm, I'm a great fan of Martin Buber's uh, work, Ishan Dao, and he talks about uh, the self and the society, the individual and the collective. And the Pakistani philosopher Muhammad Iqbal has exactly similar ideas, Manutu, which is to say, without self, there is no sovereignty. You have to start from the self, how I am different. I am different from the other three siblings that I have. And once I'm clear and confident about myself, then I can relate with the community. So I think in some sense, we do also need borders. Thank you. Uh, this, this is one of the major issues of our time globally, here in the UK, certainly in the US.
Um, I hope you've all walked away with the, some notions of the challenge and opportunities to address them through narrative. And I'm grateful to you for sharing your thoughts. And I encourage you to continue discussions and readings uh, from the people on this panel and want to thank you very much for your participation. <laughs>